Welcome to another episode of the Shots from the Winchester podcast by Greencastle. We are excited to have on a guy with a fantastic story. Um, a story that you probably haven't heard before because there's not too many people that can tell this story and live to tell about it, I guess. Yeah, so, or come back to tell it. Or come back to tell it, which is, uh, that's, a, that's a leading, that's what in storytelling they call a foreshadow. Yeah, that's it. That's what's it. to come. Uh, Danny, Shots in the Winchester podcast. We have to do a shot to kick off, if you're good with it. What's, uh, I think so, John, yeah. Bartender, Dave, you don't mind? What's, hey, your, uh, what's your drink of choice? I'll just do a, a, a little nip of Crown, probably. Some be crown. good. That's my, my father's. Good choice, gentlemen. Father was a Marine in Korea, so we'll do that in honor of him. He's still with us, 93 years old. Was he really? Still doing well, yeah. Wow. Yeah. 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 What years was he in Korea? Oh, uh, I don't know. Like, did he land and actually go in Korea? Yeah, he was in Korea. Wow. Yeah, he was in for, I think he was over there for almost two years, maybe. What are we talking to you for? We yeah, that guy. I know. Yeah, Marine, he was in the Marines, so cheers, brother. Cheers, buddy. To everybody. Semper Fi. Oh. Pretty smooth. Oh, that's good. That is perfect. Is he, uh, does your father still have his wits about him? And he does. Yeah, yeah, 93. yeah. 93. That's all we can hope for. 93, right? yeah. yeah. He goes to church every day except Wednesday because they don't have church. So then he goes to the casino. <laughs> he calls that his other church. <laughs> So, so yeah, he's he's, he's, still, he's still feisty old Marine, man. Well, and you know what? Nothing in life makes you appreciate God more than going to the casino and losing your shirt. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, uh, I don't know that he loses his shirt, but uh, he has some stories when he comes back. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Right? If he's been at this long, he knows, he knows the deal. Oh, yeah. So we teed off this conversation by saying... Uh, there's there's a piece of your story that is so unique, and mm -hmm. and uh, I read just a, a part of your book, uh, and uh, your sister-in-law, who actually introduced us, said, you, you, you're never going to believe this story. Mm -hmm. um, so take us back. You are, uh, you're, you're 29 years old, and, and take us from, from there. Yeah, so I was working for two brothers that had a roofing company, and I was uh, just almost 29, a couple of months shy of 29. And we were, me and the one brother were cleaning up at the end of the day. And we were lowering the ladder, ladder off of the house. And it was 28 foot and, uh, you know, it had a hoist on it so you couldn't collapse it. So you had to lower it straight down. So he was footing one side of it. And I was on the other side and I saw the wires and I had that feeling, you know, that intuition, the gut. And um, I asked him if we were clear. And he said, yeah, we did it this way this morning. And we started to lower it and we hit the electric line. And it had about eight or 10,000 volts of electricity in it. And it came down and went into both of us and killed both of us me and my buddy Bruce, and uh, I was dead for about eight minutes, according to the other brother that was there. And uh, after that, I came back to life. After eight minutes, I just, you know, I just came back to life. And I had my whole thoughts on that we'll explore. And Bruce didn't. We lost, you know, beautiful man, 36, three kids. Just a great guy, you know. Do you, do you remember the moment that oh, it hit you? Yeah, sure. Like, do you, do you, uh, you never gonna go away. Right, for sure, but yeah. in, in those moments of time where you know, one of those, uh, and, and I think a lot of military guys can probably appreciate like that. Mm -hmm. Guys who've experienced things like in that last moment, I remember thinking, hmm, this probably isn't the best idea. Do you remember thinking like, ah, oh, shit, like this is going to go south? And do you actually remember seeing the spark and all that? No, I didn't see it because it was behind me. Oh. So I had that intuition. So, so Bruce was, he was where you are. Yeah. And the ladder's between us, straight up. So he's got his feet, you know, he's footing it so it won't kick out. And then I walk it down. So then now the ladder goes like this, right? Yeah. And um, no, the ladder, the wire was. Is he was... up on the roof and you're down? No, no, we were both on the ground. Oh, okay. Yeah. So the house is behind you. Yeah, yeah, I got you. He gets in between it. He pushes the ladder. So now it's straight up. Yeah. Foots it. And then I start to walk it out. Because like I said, it was just one twenty-eight foot ladder. You couldn't collapse it because it had a hoist on it. Yeah. You know, so it didn't break down. And, um, oh, no, I remember it. I remember it, you know, the cliche like it was yesterday. It, as soon as it hit the electricity, a tremendous surge. Yeah. And then I had an absolute calm and peace. And it was the hardest part of the book in Back to Life to write, because I'm trying to describe what happened in words from this world about an experience that was not of this world. Yeah. And I had, the best way to describe it, I had absolute calm and peace. And I was yelling to Bruce or to Stewie because Stu was coming down the ladder now. The other brother was on the roof. So two brothers, Stewie yeah. and Bruce. Bruce passed that day. Stewie was on the roof and heard it. He's coming down the ladder and I'm yelling to him, you know, get your brother, get Bruce, get Bruce. And I didn't have any, I, I didn't have any anger or fear or anything else, you know? And, when and, you and, say you were yelling to him, you're saying like in your brain, you were actually, well, you, but so were you not, you were actually were not yelling? Well, I, or is that, is that, I pretty come? much thought I was yelling. Yeah, yeah, right. 
And then, uh, no, we'll, we'll play it out. You know, I'll give you the, 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 the short story. So I'm yelling to him, get Bruce, get Bruce, get Bruce. And then my energy, soul, spirit, whatever left my body. That was the sense. I had the sense of, of my soul leaving my body and being joined with what I call God. You know, people have other names for it, you know, energy, universe, consciousness. Were you a religious guy before this? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I thought about being a priest a couple okay. times when I was growing up. And uh, yeah, Jesus is my guy. You know, I believe his teachings. And, right on. Yeah. You, the shock hits you. Right. And you feel like you're, or you, you think you're yelling. So you're still conscious. Right. So, so as I researched, when I came back, people that have had these, you know, they call them near death experiences. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I was dead according to, <laughs> yeah. to, to, to Stu, you know, he, he came, I'll, I'll tell you, he said, you were dead. I tried CPR on you for a few minutes and your chest would go up, your chest would go down, your eyes would roll back foam. So you were dead and he gave me up for dead, ran across the street, called 911 and then ran back past me. So I had no idea what was going on here because when I left, I was joined with God and it was a very cosmic conversation. You know, it wasn't even words. Yet I knew that the energy of Danny Bader, while my 28 year old body laid there on the ground, there was still that part of me that was continuing on. And when I read and, 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 and researched other people that had nor, uh, similar experiences, we all have this consciousness and there's no anger and there's no fear and there's no, you know, you're not scared. Almost everybody says that there's this peace. And that's what Are I Are you able to like see your body? I've heard people describe No, I saw way. Stewie coming down the ladder. So I'm yelling to him, you know, get Bruce, get Bruce. And that, that's my memory, right? Yeah. So then my soul leaves. I'm joined with God. We have this cosmic conversation. I had this choice to stay or go, like many people have said. I didn't want to come back. I think that's why I was so screwed up. I won't curse, but maybe I won't. I'm sorry. Um, when I came Keep back. Keep it real in this podcast. Yeah, right. that's why I was so effed up, right? Um, so I had this choice to stay or, or come back and I didn't want to come back because what I experienced was beautiful and joyful and loving and all those words that don't even describe it. And I said, not in words, what about my mom? Cause I'm one of eight kids, my sister and then seven boys, you know, and they always, it? I'm fourth down, Four, okay. but they would always say, you know, my Danny, I'm the favorite, you know, they, they always have that. No, so, no, I don't, I don't know. You don't nobody's, know. Nobody's, nobody's, nobody's ever said that. Nobody's, about you're yeah. not the favorite. So anyhow, um, I say, what about my mom? And what about Lisa, who was my girlfriend then, Kim's yeah. sister, on and off? We, you know, we dated like five or six years and um, now we're married 30. I, as soon as I express love for them, which is the greatest energy available to us here on this planet, as soon as I express love, I'm right back in my body. It was crazy. It was like somebody plugged me in. You, now I'm in my body. You, I absolutely you said, remember it. Before we go that, down that road, you said I had this cosmic conversation. Obviously there's, there's substance to it. Do you, Okay. Was it an actual like exchange of wasn't words. of ideas or no? No, it was it was almost like I joined with this energy, which I that's my belief, right? Yeah. I mean, look, your heart, your brain, your lungs make your body go. Sure. And the fourth energy really makes it go, and when that's ready to go home to its source, so that's to God, soul, or whatever you sure. want to call it. Yeah, it's your divine energy. We all have it. We all have it. It's, it's the connection to something bigger. You know, I have my structure around it. But this is not about where you go to church or where you don't. I'm just telling you, you know, I'm just telling whoever's listening what happened. What, was, it a, was it a light? Like, can you even describe it for, for people? No, like there was no light or no tunnel. Um, you know, one time I was telling the story in, in a, in a uh, corporate setting and a woman's looking at me and she says, did you go through a tunnel and see a light? And I'm like, no, I didn't. She said, are you sure? I'm like, yeah, no, I didn't. She said, I think most people go. I'm like, yo, lady, you can have your near death. I'm having mine. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. No light, no yeah, tunnel. Yeah. But she was yeah. just like so nervous. To Stop do. forcing your death experience yeah, on me. Yeah, right, right. Um, so when I expressed the love for them, the concern, I'm right back in my body. And now I hear Stewie over here, Bruce, Bruce, he's about 20 feet away, trying to revive his brother. Now, I have no idea what transpired from the time I got hit until now I'm back. Right. Yeah. So I hear him working on his brother and I can't move because all the, you know, the electric and we're 70 percent water. Right. Yeah. So I had that pins and needles. So then I got my motor skills back. I crawl up next to him and he's working and I crawl up and he looks at me and he says, how are you here? And I said, I don't know. He actually says this to you. Yeah. You, still you, he does. you remember. I remember he does. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I remember the whole thing. Wow. And I mean, it's, it's 30 years and this my, my story's never deviated. 
from the first time I told it. You know, here's what happened. I saw you. No, I'm sure the stuff seared in, but it's, it's oh. almost surreal to hear that. Yeah. Like, he, he's trying to get his brother doing CPR or whatever. He's trying yeah. to revive him. Yeah. A guy that he had worked on left for dead, already ran across the street, come back, and, and uh, the guy he left for dead is now suddenly next to him alive. Yeah. That's got to be. Yeah. It's, it's, it's yeah, it's a real moment for him as well. So I said, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I'll do CPR. So I worked on, you know, I was doing breath on Bruce and Stewie was doing mount, or a chest, you know, and I remember Bruce had a mustache and all, you know, I just always remember that. He just, I always remember the feeling of his mustache on my lips. And all I want to do is get this dude breathing again. You know, that's all you're, that's all you're trying to do. And his eyes are rolled back. So then the paramedics get there and the police, they move us away. I go sit down. My feet are killing me. I look down, I have holes in my boots, little black holes. I take them off, I have holes in my socks oh, with black, and then I take them off. I had a hole in each side of each foot, I had four holes. But it was all cauterized. That's why the, the first line of the book is, why is there no blood? Because I was looking into a hole that looked like that almost. You know, and I'm sitting there like going, the size of a dime. Yeah, well, a little bit smaller, maybe. But I'm going, yeah. what the fuck is happening? In hindsight now, how much time has transpired, eight minutes, that you are, that's what you came to find out later? That's what Stewie kind of uh, guess, uh, guesstimated. I think the other part that's kind of fascinating is you think like 8,000, 8, 8 to 10,000 volts shot through you enough that came out and, and blew out the bottom of your feet through a hole. Um, and then you, and again, you, you almost glossed over it and I, and I appreciate the humility. You're like, so then I was doing CPR and I'm like, wait, wait a minute. Like, you know, I've gotten shocked on the, uh, you know, yeah. working on the outlet before like, oh, 120, boy, that really. Well, I'm sure I was in some type of shock as well. Yeah. But you know, myself in a, you know, and I'm, I'm certain that you, you guys and ladies that have served, I mean, you know, that trauma of, of combat and, you know, mine wasn't combat, although it probably is that notion of, holy shit, what, what, what's happening? Yeah. What just happened? And now you're just, you know, you're in that survival mode. So the thing is, yeah. as, as I'm sitting there now, looking at holes in my feet, Stu now comes over and he says, you know, what, what, what happened? And I said, I guess we hit the wire. And he said, yeah, I know, I, I heard it. And I said, I know, this first time we talked, right? Yeah. Versus when I just go up and say, I'll do mouth to mouth. And he said, I heard it. And I said, I know, I saw you coming down the ladder. I was yelling to you to get your brother. And he looked at me, he said, what? I said, I, I was yelling for you to get Bruce. And he, he looked, he said, no, you didn't say anything. He said, I came to you first, rolled you over, eyes all rolled back, foam all over your mouth. He said, I worked on you for three or four minutes. Chest would go up, chest would go down. He said, then I gave you up for dead. I'm thinking we killed Dan. We had across the street called 911, right? 1992, no iPhones, right? Yeah. That's, I don't know, minute, two minute call, right? Stay on, tell yeah. us, don't hang up. Then runs back past me, still dead and gets to his brother. So he had worked on me made the phone call, ran back past me before he got to his brother, and then that's when I crawled up. And again, there, there's something in that statement. You said, I was calling to you. I saw you come down the ladder. He says, no, your eyes are rolled up in your head, yeah. which to me is fascinating. Yeah. It, it just in that statement alone, yeah. I saw you come down. You couldn't have seen me because your eyes were rolled up in your head. You're dead, you're, you know, or you're looking the other way. Yeah. But somehow I saw you, which right. again, to me. Yeah, is so I, I believe, my belief is that that's that crossing between yeah. human and divine. When our soul starts to go, there is that little bit of, okay, I'm, I'm kind of, it's like when you're on the boat and it's going away from the dock, you know, and you, <laughs> and you go, where am I going to go? Well, you know, I went, I went to, you know, the, the, you know, the, the beginnings of heaven, I think, you know, and, and then, and then came back. I use this term loosely. Is that an experience you wish everybody could have? Oh yeah. Because it's so yeah. transformational. I do and I don't. I do because the world would be a tremendously better place. Right. Full of love. And I don't know if that's what the world's intended to be. Sure. You know, that's just kind of my own little philosophical struggle struggle. You know, I think the world is 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 unfolds the way it does. So I just tell Stuart, you know, I was calling for you and he said, No, you didn't say anything, you know, I came to you and then he kinda of told me how it played out. And then the, you know, police and paramedics are checking in. Stu told them that I was hit. Because they didn't realize it when they first came, I looked fine, right? They didn't see the blisters on my hands and the holes in my boots and all. So then they start to check me out, and my heart's still a little funky, and they're worried yeah. about my kidney and my liver and everything else. And so, you know, they're taking care of Bruce. They get him going, and then they put me in a um, ambulance. Took me to Abington Hospital. I was there for a little while. Then they put me on a chopper, flew me to Lehigh Valley, and I was there for ten days. And then got out. And then. And, and then the and then part two of the journey begins. Right. We have a, a lot of veterans here, that veterans that listen to the podcast, 
And I think there's a piece, and I've heard you talk about it before, about that that survivor's guilt mm -hmm. or or dealing with the the why me. There's a lot of folks on here that that have dealt with survivor's guilt that were in they were in the second Humvee and the first one got blown up, or they yeah. they traded seats with the guy and and he went on the mission and they didn't, and there's yeah. some survivor's guilt. What do uh, how, how do you how do you how do you deal with that? Cool. How do you deal with it? Or is that a podcast by itself? Yeah, right? that's a, well, I think you just commit to dealing with it. And and what I know now is, you know, the human spirit is very strong and resilient. And the human spirit is your soul and your connection to energy. And your human spirit is hardly human. So you just have to tap to that. I lost my faith, you know. I was like, God, you know, how could it be a God, right? Bruce has three kids. I don't have any. This is bullshit. You know, there's no God. I'm not yeah. going to church anymore. This doesn't make sense. And then ultimately, I, you know, I got back to my faith and it's even stronger now. Yeah, I think, you know, when we deal with this trauma and I've talked to many, many people, and perhaps that's one of the reasons I come back just to support other people on this, on a similar journey, yeah. that you just, you know, you got to surrender to the pain and the struggle and the, you know, the intrusive thoughts of killing yourself or, or whatever, you know, which I had and, and you just have to trust, right? I, I talk about difference between hope and trust. Hope is to want something to happen trust is to have a firm belief in the reliability of someone or something. So when I'm working with people, I'm always pushing them to use trust because it's a stronger, a stronger word for us. You still have to, that has to be balanced with, with work ethic or with. Oh yeah, like, sure. Right. Yeah, you got to get your ass out of bed and, and, and do the work, you know, which and, is, that, and that, that's, that's the hard part, you know, which is probably a what, good, I'm sorry, good. When you have such despair, you know, you're laying there, you're playing it over in your mind a million times, should have been different. What if I did this? What if I did that? You know, I don't deserve to be happy. You know, I had all those thoughts that, and we act from our thoughts, right? Our yeah. thoughts and our emotions put us into an emotional state. And that's most times where very rarely do we act from logic. You know, if you look at all the research, right? and I would agree with that. So, you know, I got all these thoughts about it's my fault. You know, his kids don't have a dad. I don't deserve to be happy. So that just slides into victim mode. You know, and then you're drinking too much, you know, smoke a little weed, you know, sleep with people to feel, you do all these things to try to feel better and, and they don't Just work. escape. Yeah. You wake up, you got the same problem and, and, and then, you know, new hangover or something, right? You're, uh, I think that's probably a good um, lead into you get out of the hospital after 10 days and what you just described mm -hmm. is, is the life that you experienced then for what, a few months or even? Yeah, well, the, the accident was um, July. And then in October, you know, a lot of people around that loved me and, and wanted to help me, tons of people. Yeah. And I just wouldn't let them in. You know, you don't let people in. Yeah. So, um, you know, one of the principles of Jackrabbit, you know, you got your Jackrabbit T-shirt on. I appreciate you yeah, filling man. that out, looking rock solid. Uh, one of the principles is seek support. You know, you have got to ask for help in all areas. And it comes from, it, it can come from people. It can come from reading books. It can come from watching TED Talks or podcasts. It can come from prayer. Um, but we really have to ask for help, especially when we're in that tough situation, you know, the struggle or the trauma. How do you yeah, so I go to the Outer Banks in October, and my plan is to go down there because it was desolate, and I'm going to buy a hose, and I'm going to drive on the beach because I love the beach, and I'm going to put one end in the tailpipe and one end through the window because I was done, man. Life had beat Danny Bader. I, just, I, I was just at that point where I said, I can't, I can't go on anymore, man, you know? So you get down there, you get the Outer Banks in October. Yeah, so I get the Outer Banks of October. I, I drink for a day or two, and then I go out to look at hoses. And uh, I didn't buy a hose. So you're actually you're actually carrying out the plan. Or you're, oh, you're I'm in still, motion. yeah, I was in this little hardware store. I'll never forget, it was a little, little cinder block hardware store, you know, in the Outer Banks. It wasn't like an Ace Hardware or anything. It was just, you know, like Bill Bill's Hardware Store or something. And I was looking at hoses, and then this little woman walked by. And she was probably an angel, I believe. She's about 80 years old, bright blue eyes, bright smile, real suntan, wrinkled skin. And she just said something. I don't even know what she said, but it just spooked me out. You know, I'm looking at hoses and I'm like, what, what am I doing? You know, I can't do this. So um, I went out and got drunk. And then I called my mom about three o'clock in the afternoon, four o'clock from a phone booth. And she said, when are you coming home? We can't wait to see you. And I had a lump in my throat this big. And I, I hung up the phone. I told her I loved her. And I walked out, and the little, this is the, the pivotal moment. I walk out of the phone booth, and that little voice in my head says, I wonder what it's going to be like when I get better. Wow. And from July until October, that little voice never showed up. It was the other little voice. You screwed up. It's your fault. You don't deserve to be happy. You know, you're a mess. Um, and, and, w and when you're in that, in that 
mindset of despair, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's hard to actually see that you're in that moment. And, and, I, right. and I, and I think what you're, I think that what's fascinating about what you're saying is there's a moment, almost like you're out of body experience. It sounds like, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but where if you are depressed, it's hard to recognize that you're depressed because that's just how you are. But it yeah. sounds like when you left that phone booth, you were like, there is like, I'm not supposed to be this way. And I wonder what it's like when I, when I cross the threshold to that other yeah. side. Yeah. Well, it's vision. I think it's so important, right? In sports and yeah. business, certainly. And it's another principle of Jackrabbit because I put together the Jackrabbit model in 2006. So like 14 years after the accident, when I went to a coaching school and they said, all right, one of your projects, you can put together a model. You know, you guys got models in business. Stephen Covey, Seven Habits, Highly Effective People. Right. And these principles have been around forever. It's just Danny spin. So I said, what principles took me from the mess I was back to, you know, reasonably adjusted in society? And the one was vision, right? Vision is the ability for us to imagine what needs to be real. And you know it in your work, right? I mean, you go in with companies and say, okay, should we have a really good four or five years? What does that look like at the yeah. end? And then everything should drive to that. Not only the action, but the frame of mind, right? The mindset, how are we thinking about that? And that's what's really powerful. So it's the ability to imagine what is real. And I think I've read in, in one of your articles, it's the ability to imagine what's real. Mm -hmm. And then, and then, but that's only the first part, right? And then, yeah. and then the execution of Action. making that become a reality. Sure. Is that, is that yeah. where most people struggle? Yeah. Or is it actually envisioning and truly well, believing that it can be real? Well, it's both. And most times people don't have that vision, you know? So, so. I don't think that life wants you to have a big, bold vision. Life wants you busy and overwhelmed, 300 emails, stressed out, <laughs> you know, uh, you, you know, come home and, and binge Yellowstone or something, right? Do you have a camera into my life or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I just lead people through. When I work with, you know, Marriott, Ritz-Carlton and, 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 and Adidas and Merck over the years and Lincoln Financial, Wawa, I'll lead people through in the workshop in 20 minutes or so. I set them up and say, write your story as if it already happened. Yeah. Health, wealth, career, finances, fun, travel, trips. Just write it out. And, and you, in the beginning, a lot of times people go, oh, this is, and I'd shared mine with them. This is weird. This is weird. And then, you know, I put on some classical music and I'll chill them out. Five minutes into it, man, they are going. They're like freaking Hemingway now. They're just cranking it out. You know, and usually around 20 minutes, I try to get them to stop and they're still going because it's about them, right? And the power, you know, Einstein said, imagination, way more powerful than the facts because the facts are here. Here we are. So you don't want to ignore the facts especially in business, right? It sucks. Yes, it does. And what's it going to be like when it doesn't suck anymore? Let's, let's focus on that. Yeah. So when you're writing your story, is that one of the most challenging things for people then to be able to write a it story is. That, that doesn't include the inherent limitations that I see for myself? Yeah. Well, you got to get clear on the story and you have to, it is a part of it. You have to push, right? You got to kind of push your story, be bold with it. Cause I'll tell people, if you write a vision and everything happens, it wasn't bold enough. Yeah. You know, you should come up short because that means you really pushed it, you know? And that sounds to some people like failure, or they could say, damn, I got a hell of a lot more done because I did this. So that's what people say to me, did you get like skeptics? Did you get it all done? I'm like, no, but I got a lot more because I look at it every week, Yeah. right? And that's what keeps me focused on the big picture, a, right? Health, wealth, relationships, you know, driving to make this into a movie. I've been doing that for years. I'm not gonna give it up, right? You meet people, it just keeps you focused, you know, on, on what, what, what do I need to take action on? And then you always just have to challenge your beliefs. You know, that, that's ultimately what it comes down to. And the best way to do that is write them down. And then there, there's a series. You look at it and you say, okay, what's factual about this? Right? So was it factual that my life was over and I did not deserve to be happy? No, that's bullshit. That's just what I made up. You know, there's a lot of people yeah. that go through trauma and go on to lead really, you know, positive lives of support and influence for people. You were a... Uh, His kids don't have a dad. Yes, that's factual right, right now. Sure. And a lot of the other ones, you, you got to work through. So you got to sort through the facts and see what, what, which ones are just your narrative of this story. You know, a lot of times people, we have, we're blessed with three children, my wife Lisa and I, and them, and even people that I work with, a lot of times they'll say, oh, this sucks. I'll validate. I say, yes, it does. Compared to what? Yeah. Uh, now nah, we got a little... Yes, it does suck. And we can move through it and... Let's keep this in perspective. You were uh, a 28 year old roofer when the accident happened. Right. You, you come out of this dark space, mm -hmm. you leave the phone booth and you say, I wonder what it's going to be like on the other side. And now you've written four books. You're an inspirational speaker. Uh, you've worked with and coached 
multiple Fortune 500 companies. Tell us a little bit about that that journey and how you got from there to here. Yeah, yeah. So when I came back, uh, I'd gone to college and majored in accounting, and I didn't want to practice that. So I went into corporate. I worked at MBNA, was a credit card company down in Delaware, and uh, I always wanted to be. I always thought about being a teacher. You know, I thought about being a priest early on, and uh, I got into their learning and development, where I started to do some workshops. And I'm like, ah, this feels like home. And then I, I started to write this book many times, and I would always bail out. And I was on a plane one time with a woman. She was probably 30 years old. I was maybe 40 or so. And I told her this story, and she said, you've got to write this book. And I never saw her again. We never exchanged information, but it was something when she looked at me. She said, you've got to, you've got to write this book and tell this story. So that's when I really got committed to that. And then... Um, you know, I just worked for some training companies and then went on my own for a little bit, uh, about five, I guess about five or six years ago. Are you on the lookout for, for signs or are you just aware enough, like self-aware? And is that something that people can practice or is it just something that's innate in you to be like, I think the universe put that person in my life for yeah. a reason? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think it's, I don't wake up every day and say, okay, who's going to come around? <laughs> Am I going to see the Cardinal or, yeah. or, or, you know, whatever I'm going to see. Um, I am just much more aware that there is a very, very fine line between here and there. Wow. And, and the people that are there have the ability to kind of check in with us. I know that to be true because I crossed the line and came back, you know. That's, a, again, so, like, that's a, such a wild and unique experience. And, and, and there's yeah. so much power in saying that, like there's a fine line, whereas I think the rest of us go, well, that's, that, there's a chasm yeah. between here and there. Yeah, it's fine. When you, when you see that. No, it's just on the other side. It's just a yeah. It's kind of a wild thing. Yeah. Um, hey, before we wrap up, uh, tell us a little bit about Jack Rabbit. You've alluded to yeah the the core tenets of Jack Rabbit and the books and and what else you have coming up. Cool. Thank you. Thanks. So Jack Rabbit is the five principles that I write about in the book, and the book is fictionalized a bit, but very much based on the story. So Jake, the main character in here, who's kind of me, he buys the hose in the book. Because my editor was saying, no, you got to buy the hose because now there's that draw. Will he use it? Will he not use it? Um, so, yeah. Leave it to an editor Publish. to say your, your real life story is not good enough. Yeah, right, right, right. But <laughs> I was so worried about fat, you know, and they being real truthful and honest. And they said, he said, no, you know, you just tell everybody this is real, this is not. So the phone booth is in there. That's all real. Yeah. You know, the hose is in there and all that kind of stuff. So Jack Rabbit has five principles. Develop vision, be still, seek support, know thyself, and evolve. And they've been around forever. It's just Danny Bader's kind of spin on it. So that's what I'll lead people through in the workshops. And any coaching I do is usually around those five principles that we get back to. Abraham's Diner is just a little um, book that I wrote on a plane back from London one time with my wife. I just had an idea. It's about a stressed out executive. And then I Met Jesus for a Miller Light is about a running back in the NFL. Which is, by the way, the great title for this kind of podcast. Yeah, that's exactly right. You and, incorporate uh, a little spirituality. Oh, and yeah. and uh, a piece of Americana with Miller Lite. That's our kind of book. Yeah. So this guy is, uh, Michael, is a running back in the NFL, and he gets concussions. So nobody wants him now, so he's type A. So now his life's kind of mixed up, right? He's like, what am I going to do? And some of his friends are struggling. He's, you know, he's a young guy in his late 20s, and then he meets a guy who drives a Camaro, has an iPhone, wears a New Orleans Saints hat. And so people see it, and they say, Jesus, is it religious? It says Jesus. And I'm like, yeah, it says Miller Lite, too. I mean, it's just a story. It's just a story. <laughs> and then... Uh, Taking the shit out of the show, seven short stories to navigate life's challenges. They are all fictional, except for the seventh one is based on uh, my brother-in-law, Bobby, Dr. Bobby Sinnott, who passed in May of ALS. And his proverbial shit show challenge struggle was, was he going to walk his daughter, my niece, down the aisle? Uh, because her wedding was planned about two weeks after COVID hit and got canceled a few times. And he was fighting this disease. And he, man, you want to talk about a strong mindset. And he walked her down. Did he? He needed a little help, but he did. Long, long, long enough. Oh, to... tough dude. That's awesome. Tough dude. So, uh, yeah, he actually, I wrote it, and then he and I sat, and we pulled up on the TV. We would edit it together because I really wanted to capture his voice because he's a beautiful soul. That's yeah. awesome. And I feel him a lot. You know that crossover? He's with me. No question. Again, that, that connection to, Matt, that's something I hope we all experience without, without having to take 8,000 volts, but the, yes, the, a little bit of a little bit of spirituality goes a long way. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Uh, where can folks find you on the interweb? Oh, uh, thanks. Just uh, dannybader.com. Um, and on there, I got all the social media, Facebook, Instagram, you know, LinkedIn and all those things. 
Danny, yeah. what, a, what an incredible story, dude. Thank you so much Thank for sharing you, it with us, man. Best of luck. I'm a hugger, man. Yeah. Get in, yeah. in. Bring it for the real day. Thanks a lot. Thank I appreciate you. it. It's good to be here. Take care, everybody. All the best.